What's up everybody, Rob here from Sage Tower Games and I'm bringing you guys videos on the brand new Pathfinder 2nd edition book The Lost Omens, The Ancestry Guide Now this is the second time I'm going through this book and the Ancestry Guide review I did some on my live stream which you can catch on YouTube and Twitch and unfortunately there was some audio issues so the quality of the video wasn't up to par to make it onto an actual YouTube video. So here we are again, jumping back into the ancestries and we have a lot of them, 14 brand new ancestries coming at us. So let's dive right in without further ado. Now, the first heritage that we're gonna be checking is the Android heritage. And this one is an interesting one because obviously we have Androids from Pathfinder first edition plus we also now have starfinder which gives us another new way to look at androids and we can check out the art for the androids and it's pretty cool like this could almost pass as a starfinder character with the robotic lines the second one not so much that's because he's trying to like use a swiss army knife or something here so but the first one definitely looks cool so with that, let's scroll down. I'm gonna skip over the physical description. We kind of know what androids look like. We are curious because obviously in second edition compared to like Starfinder, Starfinder they had a different way to build characters. So curious to see how they actually build them in this edition. So eight hit points, medium, 25 feet. You get a dexterity boost, an intelligence boost, and a charisma floor makes sense. Androids usually are penalized in charisma due to the fact that they can't read emotions that well. They can speak common, they can speak androphin, and they have a bunch of additional languages. They have low light vision, same as uh, Starfinder. Constructed, plus one bonuses to disease, poison, and radiation. And they are emotionally unaware. Minus one penalty to diplomacy, performance, and perception checks to sense motive. Again, like we said, they have struggling to connect with people. So, let's look into the android heritage. We have artisan android. So this is if you want to be trained in crafting and you also get a specialty crafting of your choice. All right, pretty cool crafting specialized heritage. The impersonator android. This is if you want to deceive and pretend to be a human. That's kind of, but you really are an android. You get bonuses to impersonating a human. You're trained in deception. And you don't have to, you need a, desire, a disguise kit. Pretty cool one. Laborer android. This one you're trained in athletics and you gain the hefty hauler skill. So very, phys very physically based kind of android. The polyglot android, or as I like to call it, C-3PO. Um, you are very a translator. You can speak a lot of languages. You learn two new languages. And if you get the multilingual feat, you get three languages instead of two. So it'd be a lot easier for you to understand all different languages out there. And then the warrior android. You're naturally a gifted warrior. You're trained in all simple and martial weapons. In my opinion, this one is probably the weakest because depending on what class you are, you're probably already trained in the weapons that would fit for your class. So... And unless you're trying to play as someone who doesn't have access to martial weapons from their class, but you still want to use a martial weapon, that's really the only purpose for this kind of android, in my opinion. I definitely think um, impersonator is pretty fun. I think that that's a pretty fun one. Outside of that, polyglot or laborer is pretty good. The android feats. So... Android Law obviously gives you gives you Android Law. Cleansing Subroutine. 
each time you succeed at a save against a poison, it reduces the stage by two instead of one. Same against like a critical success, it's by three versus two. Emotionless, you gain a plus one circumstance bonus against emotion and fears. And if you roll a success, it's a critical success instead. That's a really good feat. At level one, being able to essentially crit success against emotion or fear based effects. And a lot of like the auras for creatures are either emotional or fear based. So that's definitely, in my opinion, a solid feat to pick up at level one. Internal compartment and pretty self-explanatory. You have a spot where you can actually store some item inside you. I think Androids have that as well in Starfinder as well. So Nanite Surge. You stimulate your nanites. Gain a plus two bonus to a skill check. In addition, you glow a little bit. Lighting a 10 foot emanation with dim light around you for one round. This leads to a few things. Consistent surge. You can use it once per 10 minutes as opposed to where it usually is once per hour. Offensive subroutine. That lets you do it for attack rolls, giving you a plus one to an attack roll. And protective gives you a plus two for saving throws. So essentially, it's kind of ways to use your nanites to give you a bonus when you need it. All pretty cool. The combat one's a little bit weak, in my opinion. A plus one at level nine may not be as big of a deal. So the other ones are pretty good. Night vision adaptation, you guessed it, gives you dark vision. Pretty straightforward. Always, always good to have, have dark vision. As an option. Proximity alert. You gain a plus two bonus to perception, which is probably your standard role for initiative. So just a flat plus two to initiative. Also a solid feat. The androids have a lot of really good level one ancestry feats. Radiant circuitry. You just light up like a torch. 20 foot radius. And it shuts off when you want to or when you're knocked out. So if you ever need light, no need to cast light on an object. You are the light. Advanced targeting system. You can cast True Strike once per day as a first level arcane spell. That's pretty useful. Um, once per day kind of makes it a little bit less blah, but the fact that you can essentially... If you have that one spell, that one ability, that one hit that you really need to try and get. Having that ability to like try and get that desperate hit in, true striking it, always good. I'm going to skip Fate Influence because going through this guide, I feel like it's, it's on everyone's list and it doesn't really make sense. So I don't think it's not supposed to be there. Inoculation subroutine. So similar to the cleansing one, this one is against the diseases where it reduces the stage by two versus one or three versus two on a critical success. Nanite Shroud. Two action ability. Your nanites fly out of your body. You become concealed for number of rounds equal to half your level, so two, maybe three. You can't use this concealment to hide a sneak, as normal, but you are technically concealed. So, if you need a little concealment, like, field on you. We already saw what those did. Internal respirator, you can hold your breath a lot longer. Again, highly highly situational there's not many times that holding your breath matters really i feel like repair module 
You gain fast healing equal to your level for one minute. And while it's active, you can't use other nanite abilities. So once per day, fast healing. At level 9, you're looking at like 40 hit points. And you move it up all the way. You're looking at probably close to like 100 hit points at level 20. It's decent. It's not, I mean, it's not a lot, but like... It can be the difference between life or death in some cases. Let's be honest. Consistent search we've seen. And verification protocol. Well, once per day, you automatically come back to life. You, if you are dying, you can restore to one hit point. You lose the dying. And you can act normally on this turn. So it's this action you can do to bring yourself back up automatically. And that is really cool. Definitely a solid feat. So... Again, if I had to make a character, I would probably go... Probably either Night Vision Adaptation or Proximity Alert for the Dark Vision or Plus 2. And then... Advanced Targeting System for the True Strike. Repair Module for the Healing. And then Verification Protocol to bring myself back up. So, overall, androids are a pretty solid looking class. They are rare. Keep that in mind. They may not show up everywhere in Galarian. So, other than that, really solid ancestry. Moving on to one of my favorite ones, the Aphrodite. Now, this is a versatile heritage. So, it's not a full heritage. But this one, or creatures are kind of formed by Axiomites from the plane of the city of Axis. And they have this like metallic shine to their to what they are. So for instance, this picture is like an almost like a metallic kobold where it's like where it's very pale scales. And this human you can kind of see has this very like almost metal like uh skin really cool so they are you're born with axis you gain the afro white trait you gain low light or you gain dark vision if your initial base already has low light the feats axiomatic law simple enough you can access law Internal Cohesion. You and your allies can treat your wounds without healer's wounds. Once per day, if someone fails, you can increase the degree of failure. It sounds good, but in my opinion, it's really more of a trap. In most cases, whoever's your healer will probably buy a set of healer's tools eventually. So this feat kind of dies out really quickly, in my opinion. Intuitive crafting, we've seen this kind of with the Android. You gain access in crafting and you gain specialty crafting as a as a feat. The Lemma of Vision. Uh, you just gain dark vision. Simple as that. That's kind of like the night one from the Android. You can see very similar ideas with the feats. Crystalline Dust. Um, you become concealed, so you can't use this. Um, same thing, very similar to the Nanite Shroud from the androids. Gives you concealment, but you can't use it to hide. Leads to ancillary moats. You can use it one more time per day. So as before, it's only once per day. That would be two times per day. And then Crystalline Cloud actually makes it Instead of it being centered on just you, it goes up to a 10 foot radius. So everybody is concealed within this cloud. If you want to kind of spread it out to your party and conceal everybody. Intercorporate. You can choose one. 
if you have persistent damage, it makes it a DC 10 to re recover from it on your turn. So before it actually ticks on you. Or the disease of poison uh, makes a saving throw against the affliction. So I'll give you not another chance to deal with any of those stats that might be impacting you. Offensive analysis casts True Strike as a divine spell once per day. Seems very familiar to advanced targeting system. Analyze information. You can cast third level hypercognition once per day as a divine spell. So this one sounds like a cool idea, but I don't see the practicality in the spell. Being able to cast six recall, being able to use it and get six recall knowledge actions in combat. Um, I don't see the purpose for why you would ever need such a thing. Ever. I don't. It sounds cool. But it sounds so unnecessary. Those we've seen already. Preemptive reconfiguration. So if you take bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage, you gain resistance equal to your level of that type. Which supplies against whatever triggered it. And if you have the crystalline dust, you can use that usage for this one as well. So just a little more defensive of a feat. Impose order. This one's really good. You shift the underlying fabric of reality. If it was a skill check, you instead receive a plus, you receive a 10 plus your proficiency bonus. So instead of critically failing on a roll, you can use this reaction to automatically make it so that you rolled a 10, which depending on what the situation is, may either be a pass or a fail. But either way, it's better than a crit fail. And it also obviously it negates the misfortune effect as well, if it's something else like that. That's a solid, solid feat. And then channel the god mine. So for two actions, once per day, you can get from one minute precise motion sense out to 60 feet. You can see invisible creatures and objects, and you gain ninth level true seeing. So you are biped. You can just see everything in the world. So you can see a lot of similar feats, kind of to like what the androids have. Also, and also some other new ones. So I would say um, if you don't have dark vision, lemma of vision, or internal cohesion for the ability, to, and, and, and internal cohesion, I would probably say lemma of vision for the dark vision. I would say intercorporate to deal with the persistent damage. That happens more than you think. For the, my level 9. Preemptive reconfiguration. Then impose order. And then channel the god mine. So overall a solid ancestry. Has some really cool feet. And I think some really cool looking characters. I mean I'm sorry. That to me is a really cool character. In my opinion. Next up is the bee skin, which is a rare creature, and this is also a versatile heritage. So this one is rare creatures like werewolves, and you can see some of the pictures. This is like a bug, like a wasp type humanoid. This is like a bird humanoid. This one looks really cool, I'm not gonna lie. That looks like it could be a really cool like character, could be a, almost like a Zelda character too, really. Um, here's my issue, and I'll go through this, um, first the fact that they say uh, they, they say, here you go, Beast skin. 
Choose a type of animal such as a bat, an eagle, a shark, a spider, a tyrannosaurus, a wasp, or a wolf. That's the type of animal that you think is tied to your heritage. You could be a half human, half T Rex. Good God. That's scary. It sounds cool to change the humanoid shape. Obviously, you kind of change when you have the hybrid form to gain whatever attack matches whatever animal you pick. So you have a 1d4 piercing damage jaws attack. My issue with this habit that and we'll go we'll, when we go into the feats, you'll see why. Animal senses. You gain an one of the following senses, so either scent, low light, or dark light, dark vision. But it's based on what your actual animal has. So if your animal doesn't have dark vision, you can't pick dark vision. Critter shape. You can now uh, enter pest form, so you can be a little more of like a bug. Quick shape. So quick shape is if you need when you roll initiative, let's say maybe you're in your humanoid form, you can quickly turn into your hybrid form right away. Animalistic resistance. A flat plus two bonus to saves against diseases and poisons. Always a good choice. Greater animal senses, same thing like the first one, except this one has echolocation tre or tremor sense. Again, highly specific because not all animals might have that that you pick, so but still it gives you more senses. Animal magic. Cast animal messenger, call emotions only on animals, and speak with animals. Pack tactics. If an enemy is within reach of you, and at least two of your allies, that enemy is flat-footed against you. My problem with this feat is, that means there's three of you, kind of, within reach of the enemy. There's a good chance that you guys are probably flanking them without needing this feat for it. Sorry. Dire form. When you're in your hybrid shape, you have the enlarged effect. You become massive. Gift of the Moon. So Gift of the Moon, you cast a fifth level moon frenzy. Now, part of the beast kin thing, kind of like the werewolf, is because you are a beast kin, you kind of you don't have the same weakness that like proper werewolves do that are subject to the moon. So you don't have to change based on the moon. But the spell itself does force people to. So you gain, you know, hit points, bonus speeds, weakness to silver, you gain unarmed attacks. And it just kind of makes people go into a frenzy. It's a cool idea. You could turn your whole party into like werewolves. Animal shape. You can choose either aerial form, animal form, or dinosaur form, and you become the fifth level version of whatever that spell is, and you gain the same traits and stuff like that. Animal swiftness. Level again, this is a level 17 ancestry feat. Your speed goes up by five, and you gain either climb, fly, or swim which is based on whatever is inherent to your animal. If your animal doesn't have any of those, your speed just goes up by 10. That's all for a level 17 ancestry feed. That's not like, we just saw Channel the God Mine from the Aphrodites who could see everything around them for one minute compared to a plus 10 speed, which yes, could be useful, a lot more useful, but doesn't seem as 
major for level 17 feet. So you can see right now what my issue is with the beast skin. They don't really have anything super f fancy. There's no cool. There's a lot of things that's based on whatever your animal is to gain additional senses. But outside of that, there really isn't much there. The magic attack is kind of crap. The pack tactics is kind of crap. The dire form is pretty cool. I'll probably go dire form and animal shape. And then maybe animalistic resistance and like quick shape, but like it's not that much. It's a pretty weak, in my opinion, one of the weakest heritages that we've seen in this book so far. Let's bring us over to the fetchlings, the good old fetchlings or Kyals in Starfinder, a classic race. I've had some of them in my groups in the past. So let's check out the art for the fetchlings. Very dapper looking fetchling. I kind of like all the bling and the little feathered hat. This guy has a little like shadow staff and like shadowy hand. Pretty cool. So obviously for those that aren't are unaware, fetchlings are humanoids that have connections to the shadow plane. They usually are very gray and pale in their com in their complexion. Usually have really like white or gray or black hair. Very devoid of color, primarily. So, scrolling down to the bottom, eight hit points, size medium, twenty five speed, ability dexterity, so no penalties on them, and they have common and shadow tongue. And of course, you automatically gain dark vision. Now, heritages. The bright fetchling. Your body proves that shadow can't exist without light. You emit dim light within five feet of you, and you can activate or suppress this ability as an action. Or you can also cast dancing lights and light as cantrips. So you can just kind of you're a shadow creature that can also produce light. Deep fetchling is if you want to play like how maybe like the old school Pathfinder 1 E fetchlings, where you gain either cold or negative resistance equal to half your level. In Pathfinder 1 E, fetchlings had, I believe it was cold resistance, and I want to say electric resistance 5, possibly. I know, it was, I know it may have just been cold. I can't remember if it was cold and electric or not. But that was a very broken thing at level 1 to have resistances already, basically. Liminal Fetchling. So these are ones where, as opposed to being Shadow Plane and more Ethereal Plane, you're Shadow Plane and Ethereal Plane. So... You can kind of have a bit more bonus to locating undetected creatures. And your flat checks against concealment and total concealment is a 3 and a 9, respectively. So, a little bit easier for you to hit people that are concealed. Resolute Fetchling. You, when you have all a success on a saving throw, you can either get an emotion effect you get a critical success instead. Pretty solid. We, we saw that in the Android and the Afro White ones. Similar vibe. That's really good. This is against an emotion effect. Um, so any sort of like fear based effect can target this. Wisp Fetchling. So a Wisp Fetchling means you're a little bit more. You're a small instead of a medium. You have acrobatics, quick squeeze, and you can have a bonus to your tumble through. So because you're a little bit more smaller, a little bit more nimble, a little bit more flowy, it's easier for you to kind of move in and out and slide around. I think deep fetchling is probably, in my opinion, and resolute fetchling. 
up at the top here. Let me know. White and Wisp kind of underneath those two, in my opinion. Bacheling feats. You guessed it. Bacheling lore. So that gives you the, the uh, probably Shadow Plane lore. Yep. Hard to fool. Uh, plus one bonus against illusions, as well as will saves to illusions and shadow effects. Can't be fooled by those tricks. Shadow blending. Whenever you are in concealment or hidden due to dim light or darkness, ups the DC. So it's 7 and a 12 to kind of hit you when you are in cover. So that's a pretty good. That's a very useful way, especially if you're going to be playing into that kind of nature. Shroud of Magic. You got a free cantrip from the Occult spell list. Shroud of Mien. You become trained in Deception and you gain the lengthy Diversion skill feat. Alright, a little, bit more, a little bit if you want to be one of those sneaky types. And then Slink. You can move five feet farther when you take a sneak action. And as long as you continue to sneak, and if you end in dim light or darkness, you don't become observed, essentially. So it makes it easier for you to kind of sneak in the shadows. Definitely good if you're going to be playing like a fetchling rogue type. Clever Shadow. But Clever Shadow is an interesting one. Your shadow can perform simple interact actions. Now what's important is it cannot do anything that requires significant manual dexterity, so anything that would require a, a skill check, nor can it hold items. So when I, when I read this the first time, I thought to myself, well does it mean it can feed me a potion? It can't because it can't hold a potion. It can open the door, but it can't hold anything. But it does lead to Hefting Shadow, which Hefting Shadow allows you to store two bulk of objects inside your shadow. And they kind of remain solid, but they are still there. And you can fetch it in and out. So it's a pretty useful one. A Stingless Light, that's the one I really like. Two actions. You can wrap you wrap shadows around a single unattended light source. That's oh, that's no larger than a torch. I did not read that the first time I read this. That's important. Because I was thinking if there's like a massive bonfire, you could like snuff out bonfires. But no, no larger than a torch. So you can take out like a, a torch, a sconce, something of that kind of light source. Automatically extinguished. Or if it's a magical light source, you can do a counteract check to blop it out. Now remember, because if you're playing into the shadows, you may want to take out a sudden light to get you more of that dim light shadowy effect. A lightness, lightless, litness. Your body is almost as flexible as your shadow. When you critically fail at squeezing, you get a failure instead. And when you roll to succeed at an escape, you automatically crit. And if you roll a critical success, you can step, so a full move, as opposed to just a stride action. So it makes you a little bit more mobile. Shadowy Disguise. You can cast Illusory Disguise as a first level occult spell. Alright, make yourself pretend to be someone else. I believe Betchlings may have had something similar in 1st edition. Sculpt Shadows. So here you can actually use your shadows 
to make a level zero common item or consumable non-consumable weapon or adventuring gear so something that you can kind of use if you need a specific item but maybe you didn't have it readily available you can essentially make it so okay it's pretty cool but i think at some point you may have other you know other ways to get those tools to you Shadow Sight. You gain greater dark vision from one minute. Pretty solid. Shadows Assault. You can cast Shadow Blast as a fifth level occult spell. And at 17th level, it goes up to I think to sixth level. Shadow Blast, I like it. I've been I've had it on a few enemies in my Sunday night Pathfinder game. And it's a pretty cool, it's a very versatile spell because of the different shapes you can do with it. Pretty good spell if you, if you need it, an AoE spell damage to have it at your disposal. Shadow Blast. Skirt the Light. You can cast Shadow Walk once per day. That's, I remember, that was something that they had in 1E, Shadow Walk. And if that means Pierce the Light, you can cast Plane Shift twice per week, but only to the Shadow Plane and back. So that gives that gives you the option to Plane Shift. Now, then if I had to pick my feats for my character, hmm, I would probably say Shadow Blending, Extinguish Light. Shadow Sight. Skirt the Light. And then Pierce the Light. And play very into the shadows. And that, in my opinion, I think is really cool. I felt like in the first edition Pathfinder, Fetchlings one didn't have as much play with the shadows. They had some, but it, 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 like this one feels like they've gone more into the shadows more into the concept of kind of manipulating with the shadows, buffing your, your concealment chances, buffing your, you know, ways for you to kind of manipulate the shadows as well. All really good in my opinion. So with that, it's going to be it for our part one of our Ancestry Guide series. Be sure to follow the channel and subscribe to see our other videos for part two and part three of the Lost Omens Answers to Guide. So thank you guys for watching and be sure to check out our future videos.